Hello everyone, thank you for coming. We're very pleased to see the big audience and some members of the public. Um, this is a public lecture delivered by the European Society for Astronomy and Culture. And this public lecture, open lecture, is in the middle of our annual conference. So we're very pleased to see everyone here for this evening talk. The talk will begin shortly after I've introduced our speaker, Frankie Van der Gutt. He will be speaking for about 50 minutes. Um, and then the caretaker assures me that we will still have use of the hall for as long as we need it. That will then be the time for our open discussion. My name is Lionel Sims. I'm chairing the meeting tonight for Frank and his talk. Now, this is a conference in cultural astronomy, and Frank's talk tonight is about cultural astronomy. Um, and we began in our present um, manifestation of being cultural astronomers in the 1960s. Um, and we immediately fell into a hole, especially for those of us who work within the British academic establishment. It is a privilege to be an academic, to live a, a life of the mind, as you might want to put it. Um, but within academia, there are very strong of disciplinary academic divisions. And the emergence of cultural astronomy in the late 19th, middle 19th and late 1960s caused a furore in academia, especially within Britain. Um, and uh, literally, we sunk into a hole to which many would have consigned us to oblivion, never to emerge again. And one thing that has sustained us through the decades since then has been the great public support that we got for championing the idea that ancient cultures and cultures all around the world use the sky as a metaphor to tell their stories and tell their myths. And we all knew that all along we had that public support, even if we didn't have the support within other academic disciplines. The other academic disciplines, especially the archaeologists, denied that we had data denied that we had any basis on which to make the arguments we were making. And ever since that time, we have had to fight the fight of establishing through rigorous methods that we do have data, that the ancients and all around the world, the people all around the world, use the wonders of the sky to tell their stories and bring them together and keep them together. We have had to struggle for that idea by using very rigorous methods that are testable using the methods of science. Tonight's speaker is one of the champions in that struggle, um, and he has a long career in, in showing that there is data that can be tested. Frank is a geodetic surveyor, or um, we might use the word land surveyor to understand what he does, because as soon as Frank starts talking, I start struggling to follow some of the detailed methods that he can mobilise um, and throughout his long career, he has been very, very successful in using astronomy and land surveying, geodetic surveying, to be able to assist other agencies um, to map the precise details of a, a certain type of landscape or a certain monument. Uh, and in the work that he's done in the past, he has been to monuments such as those around the Brun of Orient, for those of you who know these wonderful monuments in Ireland, uh, in now New Grange, not in Doubt, I'm afraid, um, because it's been desecrated, but in now, uh, and Frank has been involved in going through the very, very narrow tunnels, for example, of New Grange and now, and, sh and showing with the techniques that he can use the fine details of what's going on in these monuments to then be able to validate whether or not the sun and the moon have any, have any role to play in the way that these monuments were designed. Frank has not only done this in Ireland, his home country, but he's done it all around the world in Zambia and Zanzibar um, and uh, gone around uh, uh, working for the exploration industry, um, especially in, in Zambia, for, for example, working out whether the landscape would in any way justify exploration for copper, for example. So he has a wide experience, and in travelling around the world, he has come up against cultural difference and learned to respect cultural differences and that that respect for cultural difference can feed back into the way in which he can understand the data that he's generated through all of his methods. Therefore, if anyone's going to get us out of this hole, it's Frank Pendergast. 
Um, and therefore, the talk tonight um, that uh, we, we will get from Frank will give you some taste and some flavour of the way in which this discipline, cultural astronomy, is, is trying to make sure that other academics that we have to relate to will understand that we have something to offer in the search for the truth of our ancestors and all of the cultures around the world. So thank you very much. I'll invite Frank to start this talk, and then it will be open for your discussion. Good evening, and um, it is a privilege for me to be here tonight um, to represent, um, if you like, the public side of the Act 2016. I'd also like to sincerely extend my great gratitude to the uh, Brisley Institute or Society here, and to the steering committee and the organizing committee of this conference. I've been part of that in the last couple of months, and I've seen the extensive and amazing hard work championed by our great leader, Nick Campion, who sends his apologies tonight, who cannot be here for personal reasons. Um, after an introduction like that from Lionel, I'm absolutely humbled, if not terrified. Um, <laughs> and to be able to even live up to half what he has said about me would be actually an outcome in itself. Anyway, my talk tonight, and I'm bearing in mind that there is, um, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Yeah, okay, and if my voice dips, shout. I think I'm a loud speaker, and you're good with that. Okay. Um, my talk tonight, under the hour, and what I hope to do is to give you a sense of what I do in archaeology and cultural astronomy. Um, back in Ireland, I think I can say, without being too boastful about it, that I have great street credibility with the archaeological community. To the extent that not only did I successfully complete a PhD within the School of Archaeology at the University College of Dublin, um, I did a master's back in Trinity in engineering, so I, I, I'm sort of like a mongrel scientist in a way. And in this discipline of cultural astronomy, you need to be a mongrel. You need to be multitask and multi skilled in order to incorporate the richness that comes from a multi spectral approach to any problem solving. That is the way of science these days. And I feel privileged and humbled to be part of that sort of philosophy, the new way of going about things. Um, so what I hope to do tonight is to show you uh, some of the work that I've done, uh, am doing, and hope to do. And I have two little case studies built into the end of my presentation, which I think signal where we can go in a direction that I feel I can make a contribution to. And I hope you agree and enjoy it. Um, this landscape picture is a compilation of a piece of software called Stellarium, which I'll credit later in the slide, but I didn't want to put the Stellarium logo on the image. Sorry, because the author is here tonight, and I give my apologies. And I think too many logos would spoil the broth or corrupt the image. But what I've got there, in fact, is, for this moment in time, in the Boeing Valley, a scene which is actually being created right now, the setting sun in the Boeing Valley, looking westward. And what you have in the foreground is a landscape generated from a pot called a point cloud, which is the new wave mapping from the air using laser scanning with incredible accuracy. And we can now discover things about the landscape which even 10 years ago were undreamt of based on this new shading uh, point cloud method. And what's interesting about this is it peers beneath the vegetation. What you're seeing there is a high resolution bare earth model. So no vegetation in him impinges or it prevents or inhibits the interpretation of what's there. And in fact, helicopter borne laser scanning at the South Estate in the Boyne Valley, being done now by UCD, is actually going to revolutionize because of the low level and the high precision information that's coming out of it it can actually, in a sense, peer like to a physics almost can, just beneath the soil, and it's detecting things which were not heretofore known about. So watch that space. LIDAR, light information, light detection and ranging, the new way of mapping. It's a mapping tool which has been stolen by the archaeologists, as if they invented it. Anyway, um, so there's a beautiful landscape, and we'll return to that. Um, my story starts because I tend to be very wide spectrum in terms of how I approach my subject and my science. Um, I don't just confine myself to immediate landscapes. I go wider than that. 
And if I look at Europe and the map of Europe, what I see there is modern coastline as delineated by the modern sea levels. And all that's changing. But if you go back the millennia in the past to an, a, a, an era when there was glaciation, post-glaciation, you had sea levels which were very different. And in that time frame, going back tens of thousands of years, you had sea levels which were much lower as a result of abstraction from the sea by the ice sheets, enabling humans to spread up into northern Europe as the glacial, uh, glacial sheets retreated, as the climate ameliorated, and as they could expand their territorial range. And so therefore, if you look at that map, in prehistory, it would look nothing like that now, and certainly uh, going further back than that. Up in the top left, I've got a little iconic diagram. It is an animal, a megafauna, known as Megaloceros giganteus. Anybody translate that? Giant Irish deer. It's called the giant Irish deer principally because most of them were discovered in terms of their skeletal remains in Ireland. It's a curious thing, perhaps because of the preponderance of peats and bugs, most of the skeletal finds of megaloceros, or giant Irish deer, which means big horn or megaphorn, and you can see that from the antlers. And it became extinct in the Irish landscape about 12,000 years ago. In another project where I'm involved and hope to get deeply involved in recreating, through laser scanning and 3D printing, a one-to-one -one replica of this beast for a heritage centre in the southwest. A great project which, if I get the funding to pay me, I'll do it. <laughs> it's all about funding these days, isn't it? And uh, so that animal died out, and there's a relevance to the story here because if I look at the Irish landscape today, this is by um, NASA, it's a SRTM, shuttle radar, topographic mission, image, hill shaded, that gives tremendous detail even from space. And if I look at that landscape, we see what Ireland is. Um, it is a limestone plain in the centre, fringed by discontinuity mountains, largely made up of granite in the east coast and old red sandstones in the southwest. Um, and in the Midlands, particularly, where you have this lowland central plain, you have an area which in prehistory was intensely wet, intensely wet. That is known from archaeological data and excavations. And largely that area was uninhabitable right up until perhaps the dawning of the Christian era, so to speak. And we'll see that in a graphic in a moment. But if I take the island of Ireland as a landscape and imagine um, what it might have been like in terms of human spread into the island of Ireland, over on the right here we have until very recently, the, uh, the probable, well, the likely radiocarbon dating for the first humans in the north of the island, at around, for example, 10,000 BT, the Mesolithic or Mid Middle Stone Age. That was the prevailing date in terms of the evidence. Until that, until this year, uh, just published, there is a new paper, uh, 2016, by a specialist archaeologist in Caves. And um, it has pushed the date of humans arriving on the island back by two and a half thousand years more. So we now have a new date which is almost 13,000 before present. And this is a dramatic shift in terms of backward dating of human history on the island of Ireland. Interestingly, there is data about to emerge from the island of Islay of Scotland, where lithics have been sort of contextualized in terms of their layering. And it too will show that humans similarly arrived in the island of Ireland, at least at, Ireland, at around that time. How was that done? A very interesting story. From the uh, found remains of the patella bones of brown bear. And that signals that in Ireland in the Paleolithic, we had megafauna like the giant Irish deer, like the brown bear, hyenas, lemmings, arctic foxes, an amazing array of animals, all of which are gone now. <coughs> And the point of all of this, of course, is that if I look at that diagram and we have the first arrivals of humans, 10,000 BC, the Boyne Valley is out to about 6,000 BC. We've got to go way later in time before we can actually look at human civilization uh, at that time. So we have a deep history in terms of time depth. But here you have the uh, cut marks on the patella bones, which have been radiocarbon dating, dated, which have been verified by archaeozoologists as being non-natural cut marks. These are deliberate butcher marks on the patella of brown bear, 
security dated and securely contextualized to the late Paleolithic. A revolution in Irish human history dating. Amazing. And now, what I've now done is using again the knowledge of radiocarbon dating, which generally speaking can give you anything from a half percent up to about three percent in terms of accuracy. So reliable radiocarbon dating techniques will show that tomb buildings on the island of Ireland at least, in terms of the names of the tomb types that we have now, and at least in Irish archaeology we've got a very well developed and clear topology, that is a naming system for describing the different architectural forms of monuments on our landscape. And they are described as court tombs, portal tombs, very often in Europe they've been termed as dolmens. Then we have single burials, and then we have the passage tombs, which are the focus of my talk tonight. And later in the Bronze Age, we have wedge tombs, a different architect uh, architectural form. And what we're really seeing here are expressions of different building traditions, therefore different human customs and societal traditions as well. And we don't fully understand how they link and how they overlap and how they exchange in terms of their knowledge and ideas. But the peak of the passage tomb building era is in fact around 3,000, give or take 100 years or so BC, or 5,000 years BT, before present. Um, if, as an archaeoastronomer, I dip my toe into the world of archaeology, it is absolutely and fundamentally important that we understand the broadest context of the material culture of the societies that we're attempting to um, publish on and offer discourses on in terms of the data we collect. And to attempt to do so without a fundamental understanding of the material culture of the period in which you are working and researching is, in my view, folly. Um, because you will not get the understanding nor the respect of the archaeological community unless you have that knowledge and at least are seen to be aware of the, uh, the field. And if I look at material culture, what do we mean by material culture? We mean the physical objects which people in prehistory left in terms of um, artifacts that they use on a daily basis in their everyday lives, but also personal ornaments and personal um, uh, items of adornment. And a lot of that is very much intertwined with the burial ritual, the, the disposal of the dead. And so artifacts, particularly like uh, beads and pendants, were deposited with cremated remains of the dead into the tombs, unlike the everyday utilitarian objects like pots, for example. But what's also very important is to look at the characteristics of these uh, pottery survivals and to see how they are replicated around Europe. It is those kind of studies that enable us to link, in human terms, how cultures came into contact, how cultures exchanged their ideas and traded and borrowed from each other and learned from each other and developed from each other. So when we face the difficult question of indigenous and how much was spontaneous in terms of its development on the island of Ireland or anywhere else in the UK for that matter, that is a very tricky question. But it can be partially resolved by looking at artifacts. And here we have just shards of pottery, simple things, but the devil's in the detail. And it's in those kind of details that great discoveries are made. So we as uh, contribute to archaeology by adding, I would argue, another layer. And it is our layer or layers of knowledge which actually, when it's properly presented, uh, cogently argued, and properly published in peer-reviewed journals that we can win the day and win the archaeological community and be accepted as part of their fraternity. So we have a huge contribution to make for this and how we do it. And here's one example. That's a beautiful mace head made of flint from the island of Orkney discovered in the tomb of Nelson. Indicating, and the carving is very much in the Britain, uh, the British style, it's not really an Irish style, but yet it showed up in the excavation of the great mountain of Nelson, indicating very clearly that there was trading links, especially with Orkney. Something's going on with Orcadians and Ireland. And you can look at the sea routes and understand that along the Atlantic uh, trading and cultural links could well and easily have happened. And these, of course, are scrapers and these are bone pins, all utilitarian objects used in different ways. Um, here is a construction of a house. 
most of the megalithic monuments, mega meaning big stone, they survive. Whereas timber structures don't. They rot, they disappear. And the trace in the ground is ephemeral. It is very difficult to detect. And it's really only through the very careful archaeological on-site, close-eyed inspection that you will find and detect material remains made of timber. Bearing in mind that they have been sort of deposited there 3,000 years BC, 5,000 years ago. This house is constructed on the basis of archaeological excavation of Neolithic timber houses. And this is one of the uh, best examples recreated at a heritage park in Southeast Ireland. And it's been recreated for a number of reasons. It gives a sense of how people live. And we as scientists with dealing with data in an abstract way really need to resonate and touch and try to reach out to how people live so as to better understand and to position what we do in the mind frame and mindset of people who live in those ancient times. And sometimes I think we are, can be guilty of trying to apply too much science, too much rigor, not rigor, but too much science perhaps to explain things when very often the explanation can be quite simple. So that's a, uh, a living experiment, and interestingly, um, a fire is kept lit outside, but more importantly, there is a fire kept lit inside, and the uh, experimental archaeology, if you like, that's going on there is to monitor in the long term how smoke would have affected the structure, a simple experiment. But it's one that you can go into, sit in, and be part of that environment, and it is a truly astonishing experience. An expected lifetime of at least 40 years is predicted for this structure. It's only been built a few years. And if you're feeling thirsty, inside, you know, there is refreshments. And I won't go further than that, so do come over. And uh, we know how to entertain and uh, treat our guests in this room. Um, if I take a blank screen, and if I take the island of Ireland as an example of an island, and it's a good size because, um, you know, we measure 600 kilometers in top of the and about 200 from east to west, or thereabouts. Um, and I just take a blank sheet. I'm now going to plot dots. I'm just trying to eliminate, actually I should have not shown you the island of Ireland, but just trying to eliminate Ireland as a geographic entity from your mind. Watch the bottom of the right-hand screen. And the first tombs probably built in the Irish landscape were court tombs. And that's their approximate distribution with a bias towards the top of that, of that sheet. And we're looking at Neolithic, still Neolithic. If I go to portal tombs, of which there are about 200, I've added another 200 dots, so we're up to 600 dots. If I add the passage tombs, of which we have 220, we're up to 800. If I add wedge tombs, 86 we're up to nearly 1400. Do the math. Stone rows, 250. Stone circles, about 370. And then, if I jump forward to the early medieval, and I've plotted there 50,000 dots to indicate the extent of these earthen circular enclosures. And what's interesting about pre ring fort and ring fort is have a look at that central plain that I mentioned. In here, you have this interior which is wet, environmentally unhealthy and unsuitable, and therefore covered in you know, extensive peatlands. But after the prehistoric era, and as you get into the beginnings of the historic and early medieval, you've then got occupation it measured at least in terms of the building of these ring forts, which probably accommodated family groups and their animals in safety. Um, so that, in one little slide, tells a huge story about the history of the island in terms of monumental development. To turn now to the monuments themselves, um, I mentioned the court tomb, and here is a classic case where you have a stone structure which is denuded of its covering tear. So many of our monuments have been plundered over the millennia, and they are missing probably root stones, they are missing probably the covering cairns. So what we see now in many cases is not what the builder built. And here you have a particular architectural feature, an entrance feature, very clearly defined. You have a court area for assembly, you have an antechamber, a sillstone, and a second chamber, a complex structure that reflects the religious and societal beliefs and practices of people who lived circa 3000 BC. And that's the first of our two types. 
The second, familiar to many of my European colleagues tonight, will be the dolmen type, um, also known as Ireland Portal. Um, astonishing structures in terms of how these megaliths are raised. It is thought, you know, you build an earth ramp and you haul the top stone up onto the top of the ramp and then you clear away the earth and you're left with, that's how I would do it, and I'm sure that's how they would do it, they would have done it too. And all of these are burial structures. They are associated with funerary, primarily funerary, uh, function. And what's interesting too is their distribution in the landscape, patterns of distribution tell a story, but more importantly too, for this conference and this audience, orientation of the axes in which they point tell the story. I remember um, doing fieldwork uh, with the great Clive Ruggles, who's uh, an eminent colleague of ours who's somewhere lost in Brazil and couldn't be here. That's an excuse anyway. <laughs> and we were working together in Southwest Ireland and we ascended up into the high uplands. And in the uplands, no fences, no boundaries, uh, a godforsaken wildscape, Nobody around, two within spitting distance of the road, we got out, set up the equipment, started measuring. No sooner had we started measuring. Along comes Hill Farmer with Andrew Dog on the horizon, bearing down on us with bad intent. And the dog was even worse. <laughs> <laughs> and he arrives, and I said to Clyde, being an Englishman, Clyde, let me handle this. <laughs> <laughs> so Clyde kept quiet for a change. That's not Clyde's way at all. Anyway, Farmer arrived and um, he delivered a thunderous criticism of our trespass, our damage to an already broken fence, and we let him rant, I let him rant, and then eventually I said, uh, I pleaded the case, why we were here, the important work we're doing, and we needed to determine the orientation of the monument that was on his land, and transferred the importance back onto him. And he mellowed to the point where he said, what are you trying to, I know what the monument is pointing at. And Clive then had to break silence. What? He said. Fucking trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one indication of how an audience, and shall we, a, you know, a, a site can be misinterpreted, uh, misunderstood. And we have an educated role in society, and we're gifted with great material. And we need to be able to impart that material and communicate to the widest of audiences so that we can actually progress our science. So, you know, we have um, a multi-task responsibility in terms of dealing with the scientific community, but also the public, and particularly our young people. And we need to inspire them. I'm hearing some of the papers here today, there are different tools and techniques coming downstream which are amazing. Um, if I now come to the passage tomb, which is the core part of my talk, um, here is a classic passage tomb, a developed passage tomb. And here you have a round cairn delimited by curb stones which flank the cairn. The cairn generally is made up of small stones interleaved with turves of grass for stability to hold the structure together. And most importantly, you have the entrance feature, which consists of a passage of orthostats or upright stones, uh, crossed by lintels to keep the cairn material out and leading to the burial chamber within. And inside, burial chambers in the passage tomb tradition can take various forms. They can be simple, undifferentiated, they can be polygonal, or they can be the most elaborate of all, the cruciform or cross-shaped, and we'll come to that. But what's important about this too is that on the outside and on the inside of these tombs, especially in Ireland, and especially on the East Coast, megalithic art abounds and we'll come to that later as well. And it indicates a sophistication in architecture, not only reflecting the societal need to dispose of the dead, but much, much deeper issues attached to a monument like this. For that reason, we have now moved on from using the term cemetery to complex. So archeology span will now frequently use preferentially the term complex to describe collections of these tombs. And I'll describe some of their characteristics in a moment. Down on the bottom left, orientation. If your memory was good, you might remember the previous slide showed sectoral bias in orientation towards a particular sector of the horizon, not in the passage tomb. And interestingly, that's mirrored in the court tomb as well. Each line in that little diagram represents an axis of a tomb and its direction of pointing. 
And as you can see, they point to all parts of the compass. Putting the challenge down to the modern researcher who doesn't have the gift of the manual as to how these tools were used to actually decode the meaning, at least from orientation, and perhaps much more as well. And therein lies the big risk, the big danger for archaeoastronomers, because what at first seems obvious may indeed be very far from the truth. And in this conference in the past few days, we've talked about truth, we've talked about ground truthing, we've talked about accuracy, we've talked about precision. These are the bread and butter tools that make us, hopefully, uh, proceed in a cautious and measured way in terms of how we interpret what we do and, and feed it into as a narrative to the archaeological space. Um, here is a what's called a cluster density analysis. Um, here, having based uh, my data on having visited all the three, well, 250 tombs on the island of Ireland, as it soon, I did an analysis just to show how they cluster. And it is well known that passage tombs cluster. They said cluster into what was called cemeteries, but they're more called complexes now. And those darker spots indicate a greater degree of clustering. And that tells a story in itself. Why do the passage tomb builders cluster their tombs to a greater extent than did the court tomb builders or the portal tomb builders? Clearly indicates that there is significant societal differences in the customs and belief systems of these three different traditions. And that challenges archaeology and anybody else who's trying to work with the data. And if I look at one cluster, the Boeing Valley is the most clustered of them all. And that's as good a reason as any to focus on the Boeing Valley. And here I've got, again, LIDAR, light detection and ranging, used as a mapping tool to present to you a shaded hill relief model of the Boyne Valley landscape. And the white line indicates the, uh, the, the path of the river, the course of the river. And we see, and as my colleague Francis Klein clearly pointed out earlier on, the three great tombs that dominate this Boyne Valley region are in fact nestled and in, in a sense delineated and almost framed and contained by this bend in the Boyne. And you may look to archaeological landscapes to give you to you and I wonder if the relationship between water and the, the linearity or non-linear, the curvy linear nature of the water and how it frames and encloses uh, could be uh, repeated in other landscapes. And again, as my colleague Francis Klein mentioned earlier, the association between tomb building and water is well observed and well known. And it's hard, it's, it's stating the obvious that in Ireland we can't get away from water anyway. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, when you look at the landscape, you look at the distribution of the tomb, certainly proximity to water, even the sea. And I have an idea, and it's actually borne out by Lewis Williams, and uh, I would claim to have thought it first, but I can't prove that because Lewis Williams wrote it and I didn't. Um, that I would regard the river as perhaps a route to the sea and the underworld below the sea surface for the, perhaps, disposal of the cremated remains of some of the dead, at least. To me, it would seem logical and perhaps obvious that having cremated a body, and if it wasn't placed in the tomb, and we do think that the big tombs were reserved places for high-status individuals, what about the rest of the community? I suspect that perhaps burning of the bodies, cremation, and their disposal into water would have hygienically got rid of them, but more importantly, religiously, have disposed of the remains of the dead in a journey that took them to the sea, where you have another world in the sense the liminality of the coastline and an underworld. So these are all ideas. Um, a closer in look, and you see the three great complexes that I'll deal with tonight, knocked out, just new range and out, and very briefly. Um, that's the Great Mount, and for some of you who weren't here today, this might, might be a new uh, sort of view. You have a savagely restored facade. And to say that the restoration undertaken by Professor O'Kelly in the 60s and early 70s is controversial would be an understatement. <laughs> what he has done, based on, although he has travelled to France, he has seen the Great Wall tombs in Brittany and elsewhere. And, you know, from that point of view, he is familiar with the architecture of mainland European tombs in particular, which have an affinity with this one. 
But for structural and engineering reasons, he has done something which is perhaps nowadays unthinkable. Behind that quartz facade, uh, there is a reinforced concrete wall to hold back forevermore the 200,000 tons, I'll come to that in a moment, of material which make up this massive mound. But at the front, you have quartz and granite blocks, delimited by curve, richly decorated uh, in many places. And what's also interesting here is the symmetry. And again, I bring an architectural eye to this, because part of my background is in design architecture. And, you know, I like to look to architecture and to borrow from their principles and the engineering, obviously, as well. That here you have a symmetry, which is delineated or defined by inside the chamber, the passage goes in and down, and you have a dividing line, as we'll see, which is symmetrical, either side of that dividing line. So they carefully constructed this monument as a whole entity, right from the word go. And what's also obvious when you see the plan shape is that as you near the entrance, emphasis is given to the entrance by a flattening of the facade. So again, you have subtle architectural design things going on, which are, in a sense, cultural, and they are perhaps religious as well. And outside, you have these great standing stones, which took my particular interest to so. They are early Bronze Age. They post-date the main mound. And a piece of work I did um, back in the uh, mid-80s, when computer graphics and animation was in its infancy, I was seriously challenged to investigate this circle. What I did do was build a 3D CAD model by computer-aided design techniques of these standing stones and spatially referenced it using astronomical techniques. And I was then able to, in a computerized environment, now this is back in the 80s, mid-80s, to replicate shadow casting using sunrise position through the year to investigate the hypothesis that perhaps these stones may have been deliberately placed so as to have their shadows interplay or interact with the front part of the monument, which was probably not covered by the collapsed cairn at that stage. And remember, there's two different chronologies here working. And my simulations agree perfectly, and yes, but today it's easily mentioned, ground through things by photography. Then I was able to do that, and my photography you, you would use to calibrate my computer model. And the two were exactly in sync, and it took into account all the corrections for refraction, recession, sorry, obliquity, and things like that, which we'll touch on later. So modeling this did reveal some discoveries in terms of how stones might have been used and how the shadows move in relation to the decoration of the front of the tomb, and passage of the time of year as a predictive device, as a ceremonial device, emerged as a likely narrative from that work. Um, something I've got to do when I go back shortly is a recent discovery, and I hope um, you know, this won't upset the Irish archaeologists too much. The conventional wisdom reports that the main mount of New Grange consists of 200,000 tons of material. And I decided to check that figure. And again, using my engineering and surveying, um, I suppose, knowledge, uh, a simple formula would treat the mound as it is now as a truncated cone. And there's the formula for the volume of the truncated cone. And when I did that exercise, I got a volume which was almost half this published. When I substituted diameter for radius, however, I discovered I got the figure that is published, indicating that some of along the line, has mistakenly transposed diameter for radius. So I have to confront this when I get back and uh, watch that space. It's going to be an interesting debate. Because that has implications in terms of the societal effort to build such a complex, in terms of the number of humans and the labor and the effort. That interests me. And when we look at effort, we can look to ethnographic sources. And this is the richness of our discipline, because we can look outside the immediacy of what we're trying to do and concentrate on. And if we look at ethnographic information, and this one comes from a missionary, so photographed sometime between 1900 and 1916, an indigenous community in Sumatra, on one of the islands, Pauli and Megalith, of enormous proportion. To me, this is witness testament of how it was done, how it can be done. And what's more interesting is the high status individual who's doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Standing on the block, 
uh, and you may not see it, but he's got an umbrella to shade himself from the intense heat. But look at the apparel. He is richly dressed and flanked by perhaps the second in command who is even more, less richly dressed, perhaps, and he is ornamented. And then look at the poor labourers. So that suggests to me a stratification of society, which is obvious in that and probably replicated in any period of prehistory in any culture. And to me, that is a slide or a photograph which speaks volumes. Um, when I come now to astronomy, um, we are archaeoastronomers, which is really, as Fabio or um, uh, Lionel said, it is uh, an exploration of the cultural meaning of astronomical phenomena in terms of monuments and surviving landscapes. And two things that we need to understand before we dip our toe into astronomy, and that is the changing parameters of the Earth. There are others. For those of you who know your science, Milankovic, the Serbian mathematician, gave us the so-called Milankovic cycles, of which there are more, that describe, and he predicted mathematically, this is what the Earth does in its orbit around its bones, in terms of, and that affects climate today, we know that now, uh, but also the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, it does two things. It tilts with respect to the plane of its orbit around its sun, liquidity, and it does a processional rotation, a bit like a gyroscopic top, with respect to its central or mean pole axis. And these things we know about, and they are crucial because they affect the position of some astronomical bodies in the sky when we go back in time 5,000 years or more, and we have wonderful planetary software to do all of that for us today, <clears throat> but those softwares incorporate those kind of corrections. And we know their period. We know how long these cycles are. And it's easy to go back and to correct our view of the sky as it was in the Neolithic, for example. And if I look at this little plot of the obliquity, I chose obliquity because it affects the sun most of all and it will affect new range of the sea. And we talk in terms of, it's a bit like climate this language, previous maximum, the next minimum, now. Here's our date range along the bottom. Here we are at the time of the Neolithic, 3000 BC. And there is the sun in terms of its azimuth at sunrise at the latitude of new range. So we can plot that. And then here we are now, there we are in the tomb time. So this is the current date, the modern date. And the next minimum will be around 11,000 AD. That's the turning point in the cycle. It's the half period of the obliquity cycle. We know all of that. And it is precisely computable and we can build our corrections into our models. <coughs> and that has great relevance for what we do. Because if we now take a view of Newgrange, the archaeological cross section and the plan view, we get these wonderful images done by my great colleagues uh, Geraldine and Matthew Stout. Um, archaeologists who have prodigiously worked on the Bowen Valley. Um, and there is a section through the mound. Bear in mind that that's about 13 metres high. Inside you have this enormous corbel vaulted chamber. And there you've got the ground level and axis sloping up. Most importantly, you've got a penetration into the mound which allows the rising sun at the winter solstice to penetrate to the back of the chamber and illuminate it. For a period of you know many minutes and it does so day after day after day for a period now of about a week and then it's all over for another year and here is the passing plan of that phenomenon and it is a spectacular phenomenon all is made possible by this special opening of which on the island of ireland there is no other example and it singles out new range one as a unique construct in engineering and archaeological terms. And no other two. There are one or two that have proto or putative openings that perhaps come close, perhaps come close. And there may be one or two off the island, but this is perhaps the premier example. That's about a meter wide and it varies in height uh, from about, I think, 30 centimeters down to something less than that. So that's, that's the opening preserved by the excavation archaeology very carefully because they had huge renovations to do to get this mound restored. But there was great care taken with this construct, that is for sure, because the drawings and the testimony show. And here we have a laser scan image of the passage as we enter and as we approach the mound. And the wonders of technology these days, because from the science of mapping from which I come, LIDAR has now been modified to terrestrial laser scanning as well. 
And high precision laser scanning is done as we go into the tool and you can now stitch the models together with high precision so that you can get sub-centimeter accuracy all the way through from a model like this. I will attempt to do the uh, impossible and get it to work. <laughs> it worked. And here we have a walkthrough uh, down the passage as you would experience. So here we have immersive reality. The ambulance driver likes it. <laughs> and you see the narrowing of the gaps as the orca steps in line due to geotechnical pressures on the map into the chamber. Turn right, where the emphasis is on larger, more elaborate recess, space and stone. The cruciform tomb, the end recess, where the light beam will penetrate down to the back of the passage in Neolithic times. And to the left, as you enter, another side recess with a base and stone on which were placed cremated remains. And then upwards, we look at the corbelling, an ingenious technique to weatherproof the monument. Excavation shows that the upper hidden surfaces of the corbel stone have grooves, which were designed to carry away rain, so as to preserve the dryness, and it's still dry 5,000 years later. Not a leak, not a leak. And the capstone which seals it off. And above that, you've got a couple of inches of plant material. And there's a view back out. And it is the view back out that is interesting, because as you, if you were in Newgrange, you put your eye at ground level to get a view through the root box. You find that you are impeded to a certain extent by these inward leaning orthostats. Over time, these have pressed in. No attempt will ever be made or could be made to erect them or to correct them. A far too risky operation. But that's the view out. And it is through that opening and the root box, which is not shown there, but I'll show it in a moment, that you get this amazing spectacle. Replicated at other monuments up in Scotland as well. Some of you will be well familiar. And in the, uh, in the Americas, this uh, hierophany of light, shadow, is a spectacle which is repeated in all cultures, all time. Unique, not only to the Bowen Valley. So obviously, from a religious and a belief system point of view, these were important events and manifestations of bringing the power of perhaps the most primal celestial object into the body of a monument and incorporating its power into the meaning of the monument and its role perhaps with the dead and the spiritual journey that they might undertake. And it's a periodic thing, it's a seasonal thing. So it is special, it's reserved, it's predictable. And therefore, undoubtedly, ceremonies would have taken place around these events in those times. And whereas in early archaeological writing, such things were suggested. It is really true that the emergence of the science and discipline of cultural astronomy and archaeoastronomy that in fact these things have been, the narrative has actually been widened and made scientifically valid and acceptable. So that now archaeological writing often will reflect these contexts. And I think we can take credit for that. Um, when I look through the root box in this diagram, this is looking out. Uh, the horizon line is going to be about there in the distance. And here is a cropped version of, no, sorry, this is the roof box. And here is where the disk of the sun now rises on the horizon. And you can imagine that as it rises and tracks upwards and to the right, the phenomenon is going to last about 15, 20 minutes at most. Wind the clock back. 5,000 years make the correction for a city, and you have a position which is to the right by about two solar diameters. Now, a lot of archaeologists ignore this, but what this means to me is that in prehistory, at the time contemporary with the monument, when the orthostats of the passage were upright, the view of the roof box would have been entire in terms of its width. The apparent view of the horizon would have been complete. Now it is significantly cropped. And the phenomenon and the spectacle of illumination at solstice would have been far more dramatic, in my view, and it would have penetrated further into the passage as well. So over time, there's been a little bit of degradation and deterioration. Now we have this situation where the sun is here, and obliquity will push the sun actually out beyond the limits of the roof box. 
The turning point in the cycle is around 10,000, 11,000 AD, and I won't be around to test that theory, but it's predictable. And I use high precision instrumentation to generate just this one diagram. I've used what's called the gyro theodolite, which is a tool that we use in tunnel driving to ensure high precision meeting of tunnels. It's a standard surveying technique. But I used it in this instance because it has the liberty as a meridian determinant and it has high precision. So it's an issue that one can use in reserved circumstance. However, um, the sun will go out, the lights will go out at New Grange millennia ahead. The manager of the Bloomingbone Adventure doesn't want to know. <laughs> he throws her eyes and ears to this news. <laughs> Wonderful. And that brings me then to the wider issue of, you know, skyscape orientation. For many, many decades, our community has been studying the phenomenon of rising and setting celestial bodies, be they the most prominent or perhaps less prominent. And other objects too, like comets. You know, I mean, phenomena appear and go. They would have been recorded and observed. But if we look at what we've got here, sun and moon, two prime candidates, they are there, they are constant, they repeat, and they are predictable. And what we do there is just try to um, give a sense that if you're in the middle of a circle or a monument or a landscape, <coughs> and you as a farmer in the Neolithic will be intuitively aware of the passage of time based on seasonal and environmental factors. You do not need tools or precision instruments to tell the time. You do not. I think that's an insult not only to modern farmers, but also to prehistoric farmers as well, in my view. <clears throat> so people then would have lived in their landscape, survival depended on knowledge such as that. So they would have had a thorough understanding of the natural cycles of rising and setting and the seasonal movement of, and we are in August, we've gone past the equinox, sun is rising about there these days, and come December 21st, it will dramatically and significantly move along the horizon. In cityscapes, we don't see that. Moderns don't observe it. We've lost the connection with the sky. And this is the value of skyscape and the skyscape archaeology. It teaches modern humans to perhaps reflect on what we've lost. And for me, that's one of the big messages. So here we have kind of cardinal directions, and we have extremes and predictable turning points. The word solstice means to stand still. And stand still is exactly what the sun in particular does, as does the moon, and they reverse. The cycles of the sun are simple in terms of observation. The cycles of the moon are much more complex and difficult to comprehend. But nonetheless, in prehistory, I have no doubt that rituals were conducted based upon observations and connectivity with all of these celestial objects. My approach to archaeoastronomy, and one that has served me well amongst my Irish archaeological colleagues, is to approach archaeoastronomy as the last card in the deck, having first looked at all of the other alternatives. And that is a good scientific method. In other words, we know from archaeological studies, investigations, and landscape assessments that there are many factors that can explain why a tomb and axis is orientated from being purely random up there, all the way through all of these reasons, and they all emerge in the archaeology of monuments. The evidence is there before our eyes. And to jump Wellington boots and all into an astronomical hypothesis before we have considered perhaps the more prosaic reasons as to why communities in prehistory might have orientated their tombs is in fact false. And from that point of view, at the drum I beat very loudly and strong. Um, when we look at the science of astronomy and we measure the orientation, one of the astronomical parameters is called declination. Tonight is not the time to go into that. But declination is like a map coordinate in the sky. And its values and its limits or extremes tell us things about directionality in tombs. And if I look at the passage tombs of Ireland, all 136 which had measurable axes, uh, peaks emerge in that. And at our conference, we hear interpretations of these peaks and arguments and discourses about what they mean. And in there is embedded the solstitial, equinoctial perhaps, and other things besides. 
I don't have time to go into these, but there's a much bigger story that will come out of that diagram in due course. I'd like to address the meaning of art. If there is one subject that is contentious, it is this. And megalithic art, just to put things in perspective, the Boyne Valley has nearly 700 engraved stones out of 900 on the island of Ireland, out of 1,100 in continental Europe. The concentration in the Boyne Valley far outweighs anything found elsewhere in mainland Europe. It is astonishing. And what's that saying to us about the civilization and the community that existed there and embellished their monuments and for what reason? So when we think about the meaning of art, we approach it from a multi-factorial perspective. Um, and when I look at those stones, these are generated by laser scanning. And <coughs> my voice tells me it's nearly time to shut up. I have a little way to go. Um, those two diagrams the, are laser scans, which is an amazing tool now for conservation. We now have 3D models of these special objects. So should they ever be destroyed? God forbid. We have at least preserved them digitally. And what's nice about these is you can generate 3D PDF files, you can rotate them and zoom in. The resolution of the pine point cloud on these objects is a half millimeter. So every half millimeter are leads used to um, the calculation of how many points went into, and it's collected in seconds. It's collected in, well, at the minute. So the technology is phenomenal. It's but look at those two stones and their placement in relation to the Great Mount Food Range. Have a look at the plan, first of all. Observe the symmetry. Observe the dividing line, which is, in a sense, an axis. Again, wearing my architectural eye, axis is the most fundamental construct in design property processes, irrespective of time, past, present, or future. Talk to any architect. Axis is fundamental as is view, and sometimes orientation too. So I tend to borrow a lot of my narrative from architectural design theory. And to ignore it is just stupid in my mind, because it's there, it's a, it's, a, it's a discipline in itself. But look at the placement of perhaps the most, two most embellished and elaborate uh, decorated curbstones. And you see that they are in a sense, defining either end of the <coughs> axis of construction, the symmetry that divides in a bipartite way this great man, suggesting that this was thought through from the beginning. It was preconceived as a construct. And this wasn't something that sort of organically grew with different ideas over time. Look at the vertical groove there and there. And that repeats at now. And those vertical grooves, to me, perhaps, in a sense, are emphasizing or broadcasting that these perhaps are very special architecturally placed stones. And uh, a French scholar uh, who has done work on the placement of art in terms of tombs has actually a very strong case to make that the artistic embellishment in relation to architecture is a way forward in terms of interpretation. But when it comes to looking at the art itself, um, we can use the term plastic. In the history of art, where you have a canvas fully decorated and embellished in its entirety, the word plastic is used to describe the way in which the artist has applied. So here you have composition on a most developed scale, sympathetic to perhaps the ground function of such a huge mound, irrespective of its volume or perceived volume. And here you have, in my view also, um, perhaps a dividing of the left and the right. There's a symbolism perhaps being communicated here, which suggests a left and a right. And uh, earlier today, again, my colleague talked about this left and right differentiation. That could be coming through in this part as well. But to look at that and then try and interpret it as, you know, uh, motifs which mean something now in a very challenging and difficult process. <coughs> And if I go to now quickly, um, here you have the Great Mound of Now, which we now know was a multi-phase monument built as an inner core and an outer core. And the evidence for that 
as well as the internal architecture or excavations inside, show that some of the satellite mounds which were built before the extension are butted off and closed off. So this mound expanded for whatever reason. And that's a really interesting uh, mound because if you go to my website under my name on academia.edu, uh, myself and the astronomer Tom Ray have a paper published on the orientation of this mound. There are two tombs and two passages. And in particular, the western tomb, which emerges here actually, is bent. It's an angled passage. <coughs> and the bend coincides with the enlargement of the smaller to the bigger. And if you look at some mischievously published publications, the more people thought about the western tomb being aligned on the setting sun at the equinox, the more the angle in the western passage was straightened out in the drawings. <laughs> and I have some drawings which show the western passage perfectly straight. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll park that idea in your head as a caveat. Uh, you know, some stuff does carry a health warning. Be careful who you look at and who you cite. But nonetheless, here you have a magnificent man. And two artifacts from that. Uh, curbstone K15 outside, and one of the basin stones inside. Again, created with half millimeter resolution laser scan. And superb detail emerges. Some of it is fading, it's eroding, certainly the external part. Art was placed in the tomb strategically, we now know or suspect, but also inside and in important places within the architecture of the tomb. So they had ideas and knowledge about what they were doing, it was religiously driven, it was spiritually driven, all sorts of reasons. And I've avoided use of the word cosmology until now. Um, but you can think of a lot of what I've been talking about as cosmological in terms of how people engage with their wider skyscape and landscape and what the universe meant to them. And certainly what the universe meant to them was expressed in the creation of these amazing objects. And when I look at the, uh, this is the end of the, the main part of my talk and two short case studies to go. You've done amazingly well in this heat to survive, and I really appreciate your attention. Um, I've plotted here a distribution map for tombs that are either passage tombs or those which exhibit qualities and characteristics which are closely affiliated to the passage tomb tradition. The word in archaeological writing is the Atlantic facade. I just love that word. I wish my house faced the Atlantic, and I was <laughs> <laughs> my house faces the Irish Sea, and it's not big enough either, so I can't use that address. But the Atlantic facade is, in a sense, the canvas on which cultural groups spread through Europe. I'm not getting into chronology, I'm not getting into genetics, I'm just simply treating this as a distribution map, which terminates up in my beloved Sweden, up here, where there is a significant clustering of the tombs there. And my good colleague, I, I couldn't let my go without crediting Fabio, when I started work on plotting and searching for uh, Portuguese tombs, Entered my rescue and got me out of Portugal uh, fairly fast. But we have nearly, I suppose, more than 2,000 dots on that map. And I'm not yet finished. It's work in progress because when I come to Denmark, I've only plotted a fraction. I think I've got about 150 dots out of a potential 7 to 900. So it is quite astonishing. And it is the links and the exchanges and the contacts between civilization at that time that inspire us to do what we do in terms of our research. Two final case studies. How are we doing on time, sir? Sure? <laughs> 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 One hour and five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. And a half five minutes? Five minutes. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> I think I'm costing the conference in terms of red blood <laughs> testing. Sorry, world. <laughs> um, two things, the horizon. Um, two pieces of work I've become recently engaged in, and for me, exciting. And I quote uh, an architect, he's not a friend, he employs my son, except for he is a friend by. Like. <laughs> um, skylines can themselves be monuments and monumental and are the domain of power. Think about it. On the horizon, you have the rising and setting of the spectacle of disappearing and appearing monuments through the year, seasonalities are measured. The horizon is a fundamental construct, albeit natural. And the protection of that horizon is crucial. And I was called upon very recently in a planning application for a wind turbine uh, build, a project which was submitted for planning application. I was contacted by the National Archaeological Unit. 
to support their arguments that this should not be built in that location. <clears throat> and being familiar with the area from my field work, I said, sure. And here I'm on the summit of a tomb looking across a valley, a landscape which is archaeologically rich, a ruined tomb with an axis which is pointing at the summit of a passage tomb there. And that's a view which should be protected in my view. There are the intended 125 meter high turbines, which are going to be, if permission is given, constructed. Out to the right, there is another tomb, a listed national monument with a winter solstice sunset. And the excavation archaeologists, uh, archaeologists asked me, could I check how these turbines would impact on the setting sun of the winter solstice and boots in that tomb on the right? I use solarium to great effect here using calibrated field photography merged into the planetarium software Solarium and I created one of several views for the submission to the planet. And that shows that the exposed chamber, the western tomb, and its orientation in the setting sun at the winter solstice, 21st of December, thereabouts. When I looked at a digital terrain model on the plan of the proposed turbines and the line of the solstice sunset, three of those turbines would impact on the rise of the setting sun phenomenon, and significantly or perhaps partially interfere with it. The archaeological objection was therefore based and built on an archaeoastronomical submission. And archaeologists said they had never seen anything like this before. This was a first. And it gave solid scientific argument and build for the case. And what we have here is a cross section. These are crucial. I put the two scales, the turbine, the monument over here, the grazing ray, and I was able to show, in terms of partial um, percentages, how much of the blaze would be visible on the horizon. The case was therefore built, and I'm just shortening just two sentences, the turbines with visually impact on the horizon sky interface. Here we have it. Associated with the setting sun of the winter solstice. So now we've got astronomical uh, uh, factors into the planning of <coughs> the planners staff and naval gaze and deliver this. Reject the turbine development leisurely. The proposed development would have significant adverse effects, the impact on the landscape and visual immunity. And then most importantly, the landscape contains a number of interrelated archaeological built heritage sites which I developed of national importance that enjoys prominent and uninterrupted setting. The planning application has been denied. Um, secondly and last, can I still go on I just still no, 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 no. Okay. This is value for one, isn't it? It is. I'm not being paid. <laughs> <laughs> Cultural heritage and dark sky, another recent project. And I've become really involved in this because dark sky preservation in an archaeological prehistoric landscape is to me inseparable. The skyscape experience in prehistory involves the dark sky as well as the day sky. And therefore, as entities in a landscape of archaeological importance, we have to treat the skyscape in all its forms as crucial to understanding landscapes. So UNESCO hopefully uh, usefully comes in with categorization and instruments and avenues for taking this work forward. Have a look at the clock in the top left. Europe is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And you know, we're all aware of that. Planning is now introducing improved and better lighting. So we can conserve and uh, protect the dark sky to an extent, but you can't stop development. So landscape archaeological uh, of importance. I have started work with spatial planners, with developers, land managers, heritage tourism, academic research and community. These are all the stakeholders in this kind of uh, project. And you can now apply for and get status for a dark sky area. And this has been done throughout Europe and the world. And it helps with tourism, it helps with planning, and there's all sorts of uh, positives that come out of this. And in Ireland, we have, in the Northern Hemisphere, the only two dark sky gold cheer reserves. That's just awarded. And the Boyne Valley is now in my radar. It has nothing to do with these, they did tremendous work. But I'm looking at Boyne Valley as a case in point where we can at least go through some level of protection. It's done using meters which can be connected to the web and are left running, and they deliver data which then supports the application process and enables you to get designated. And um, all of that feeds into, we're there now, folks, we're at the end. Um, the great rise in recent 
publication which showcased and championed the research work undertaken by our European brothers throughout so many countries and into the United States. So we have a world uh, handbook in three volumes here published two years ago. Don't rush out and buy it. It's £900 sterling for the three volumes. But in that you have the benefit of science, of scholars across all continents. And we are now such a richer community for these kind of publications, which this society and this group in particular are in fact pioneers in terms of the development of these publications. And I'll finish with that slide, which for me embodies what Skyscape and religion and I suppose experience is all about in terms of ancient monuments. So monuments were built for a variety of purposes. They're ceremonial, they celebrated or marked the journeys of the dead in different ways, they were the places where rituals were conducted, and of course the passage of time, the seasons. All of these are just one amalgamation of many elements which make up an archaeological landscape. And in prehistory, and it is, I would say finally, what a privilege to be able to do field works and to be able to research and hopefully from time to time come up with meaningful uh, uh, conclusions and to feed into hopefully a, a wider debate in terms of archaeology itself. Thank you for your attention. I feel a bit like Hillary Clinton. My knees have just gone. Sit <laughs> down. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. We've had passion, enthusiasm, and commitment from Frank, which is a wonderful advert for our discipline. Um, our discipline of brothers and sisters uh, in SIAC and elsewhere. And uh, Frank has gone through geodetic surveying, archaeology, ethnography, astronomy, and architecture ranging through and giving an example of the range of methods and uh, theories that we have to engage with. So amongst your number, I'm sure you have your own expertise um, and you can address that to Frank in the question that is now open to you. The floor is open to you. So who would like to pick up the question? At the very back there, thank you. I'd like to ask the question about wind farms and the Okay. Thank you for that question. Um, what do you say is having an effect on the building? What, what, um, I didn't on, on the building remains, of course. The main one is mostly affected by the original weather, but not the main one. So, also, they tend to be where wind farms are. They do. And <clears throat> part of the attention now is certainly in the landscape of Ireland, and the usefulness of showing my job map shows you that no matter where you go, there are going to be monuments. But there will have to be compromises, undoubtedly, and at a local scale. I have no doubt that perhaps if this project is reconsidered and perhaps shifted, um, the contentious part of the alignment clash between three of those turbines and the seven son of Wimpy Salsas will be removed. Then archaeology and astronomy to a certain extent can step back to them. But landscapes are archaeologically rich or not. There are lots of areas, alternative areas, where you know you can build these things. And I take your point that with climate change, green sustainability and green energy is all important. I also take the view that things like wind turbines, unlike nuclear stations, are much more easily dismantled in the future than a nuclear power station will ever be. Decommissioning of wind turbines is, you know, but there is growing opposition, and I'm sure in the UK it's probably similarly felt to these monsters. Um, you know, and they are massive. And you know, like it or not, communities at a local level hate them. That is my that is my knowledge, that is my feeling. So we're gonna to have to live in this world with you know that compromise to a certain extent. Over time, monuments will degrade. I mean I know the art on the exposed stones, but that's more of a weathering process than anything else. Um, in terms of extremes and uh, temperature and rainfall and wind, perhaps not so much in terms of, because we're dealing with megaliths, we're dealing with monoliths, stone structures that are 
huge, massive, permanent, and will survive long into the future, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I take that point, um, but I also ta take, uh, make the point that where there is a conflict of interest between development-led structures such as that and an archaeological monument and its sensitive alignment and the pristineness of the horizon, that must be protected too. And therefore, as a community, archaeologists exist to fight on one hand, and then you'll have others which will propose it. And then it's down to political and the planners to make the right decision in the right time. Don't have every not be over I'll take your point. Thank you very much. Yes. In the work that you have been doing, very widely spread in this part of Northwest Europe, and in Central America, part of Mana, the leaves parts of Mexico, in say 4000 BC, uh, 2000 BC and 2000 AD, uh, in connection with the Mayan civilization, you were very sensitive to certain national bodies, bodies, the sun, the moon, etc. I don't know very good detail. But do you know any comparative research in those two sections? Well, I think I think I'll throw this one out as well because in this audience we do have the benefit of you know uh, Mesoamerican American specialists as well. Uh, but broadly, um, you know, uh, the phenomena that occur in Northwest Europe are well replicated and well, you know, evidenced in the Americas. And in terms of the Mesoamerican American culture, that is a much more highly developed culture in terms of the calendrical of evidence that is there. And, you know, you are looking at societies that built great temples and pyramids and, you know, they had very advanced calendars in terms of observation of orbits and beasts and whatever else. So, a very different scenario. But when we're dealing with prehistoric, 3000 BC, Neolithic Europe, there is no comparison. Don't be recognized. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. I will. Of course. There we go. We have um, um, David here. We'll pass around the microphone for those of you who want to speak so we can all hear the questions you're, you're posing or contributions you're making. Who would like to make a contribution or ask a question? I think we've exhausted the matter. Great. Well, thank you very much for your excellent lecture. I enjoyed it very much. Um, comment, a comment and a question. Comment. You have shown us a map from continental Europe. And uh, it is a pity that Germany has no megalith remains. Uh, well, but it, it, not. It, it, it is not the case because 100,000 such megalithic remains had been there in the 19th century, and they had all been destroyed by far. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is for the Netherlands, there are all the noises of moon and bed, and so on, you know. And I know uh, other colleagues also working in the field. So, probably, the statistics are still not the right one. So, I think that faith is, mm -hmm. is a problem. Sure. Now, my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have visited all the islands. And um, I have contact with Ruby Key about uh, the new archaeological data showing up a very, very high megalithic civilization. And I noticed that um, comparing um, the relics from Ophiada with Malta. Comparing what? Malta. 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 Comparing what? Comparing the Ophne Island, yeah. the remains, the archaeological remains, yep. the objects, the yep. museums, and so with Malta, or Key yep. relics. They are very similar. So, probably there had been some seafaring nation with all the abilities they need for seafaring uh, and so And they needed also astronomy, not only farmers. Sure. And then you have the northern, the northern line, let's say, mm. probably reaching into the Mediterranean area. What okay. do you think about that? Mm. Right, quite a lot there. Um, thank you for the questions, Michael. Um, on the map, I did say in the talk, work in progress. Okay. <laughs> work in progress. Uh, I have not finished with Germany. Um, with the Netherlands, I actually posed the question, in prehistoric times, sea level 
might have radically reduced. Was the Netherlands even there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, was? <laughs> Chair, I'm fighting for my life. <laughs> no, but um, in, in terms of the uh, passage to tradition, he says jumping into a safety net and looking for affinities with the passage to tradition, which are round mounds and delimited by curves. I have yet to filter a lot of the data that's on that map for in terms of topology, and I've also got to expand in terms of sites that I've missed. I've only just started this. In fact, when I say just started it, spent most of the summer looking at it. And that's what goes into one diver, as you can imagine. But when it comes to Malta, and the, um, I'm not ignoring Malta, but is it not fair to say that the tombs in Malta, which I had the great pleasure of visiting two years ago, are in fact temples, primarily temples and not funerary, whereas there are hypogeans and other structures but the great temples of Malta, of which there is astonishing art, of which there are similarities, undoubtedly. And then you have to take that mental leap and say, what are humans doing artistically in one part of the world if they're not in contact with their brethren elsewhere and they're still reproducing those things? You know, that happens. So it's a very difficult thing. But the passage to tradition is not exclusive, but primarily funeral. They are places for the dead, which the Maltese tombs are not, the temples are not. So that, for me, makes one big distinction. And uh, ritual was undertaken in the Maltese temples in a way, perhaps, that it wasn't in the passage tombs. Um, so there is that. It's a complex question. There isn't a short answer. And, um, but thank you for the question. Last question. No, the um yeah, nice nice question. That um I never say it's a good question because in my book every question is a good question. I I, I like your question. Um the week uh, tombs that have sort of been untouched or excavated sensitively in the very modern era would show or suggest that quartz, which I take a particular interest in, um, the properties of quartz are particularly um, distinct. Apart from, on the geological scale of hardness, it's seven and ten. Diamond is ten. Quartz is seven on the mode <coughs> scale of hardness. In terms of scratchability, you know, um, that's how they measure it. Quartz and the property of quartz is special uh, in prehistory in most cultures. And in fact, in Britain, where quartz wasn't so prevalent, prevalent um, gypsum was burnt so as to make it white, and then it was used as an equivalent to quartz, which is interesting. But quartz boulders adorn, the, uh, in most monuments, the part of the front facade, never the back. It's always towards the entrance, the business end of the monument, as you might like to put it. And there is also a thriving and vigorous debate going on at the moment in Irish archaeology, especially in relation to Newgrange. Was that quartz a wall or was it a platform? And I take a sort of prosaic view of this. If you had quartz blocks as a platform and you try to walk on it, <laughs> it's going to hurt. If you want to make your monument visible, which is what these monuments were about, they were showcasing their structures. I just mentioned the passage tombs, in comparison to all other tombs, are strategically placed on the highest local ground, almost exclusively, unless you have tombs which are minor, subservient, and orientated towards the main larger tomb. So there's a hierarchy of hype going on. That's another discussion. But um, grass would have grown naturally where quartz was placed on the skin outside. That would probably have been kept clean for the duration of the use of the tombs. A period of probably two, three hundred years. Passive tombs are confined chronologically to about 
a time window, let's say 400 years at most. They do extend out, but the main two buildings, so over a few hundred years, and then they cease to be used. So I would imagine they maintained the tombs. Because if certainly ritual and ceremonies were undertaken and they're a place for the dead, you would look after it, just as we look after our cemetery and burials today. It's no different. And, um, and then over time, of course, grass invades and everything disappears and it just becomes naturalized. So that, that would be my take. Okay? But in many cases, the covering cairns have been destroyed. Uh, local farmers, as Michael rightly said, there's been a huge rate of destruction across Europe by agriculture over centuries. And they would borrow the material for uh, wall building. They would recycle the earth back into the fields. So all of that went on. And that explains the denuded appearance that so many of our megalithic structures have today. Okay, and I'm answering Michael's earlier point about destruction, which has, we have lost, obviously, a huge amount. Um, how much given the fact that the these monuments were stones were apart. Were there a lot of chipping going on? Or did they just erect them? I mean, how much thought went into making sure that each one fit with the other? I mean, and did you find are there any tools hidden around? You know, any tools discovered around? Okay. The, um, first of all, in terms of their uh, morphology or shape, uh, these stones were worked into the shapes that were fit for purpose in terms of the orthostats in the passage, and they could have a flank, and all of them do, and that flank would have been rotated so as to give the longer side parallel with the passage. With the curved stones, again, morphology was created, and they were then orientated and positioned. The tools for doing so simply had to be harder stone, and this is where hammer stones made of granite, hand sized, and quartz, coming back to our scale of hardness would have been a chipping tool which would have enabled you know, uh, other forms of stone to be worked. A huge effort. I mean, I, I can't imagine the, uh, the time and the agony of trying to do this. And then smoothing them, um, it's just astonishing. But when it comes to the embellishment, the art, you go in close, I didn't show it too well, and you see picking. And that is thought to have come from uh, just quartz uh, pebbles perhaps being banged against. So as to uh, leave decoration in relief or to incise grooves into the stone itself. So there are different techniques of uh, decorating and creating the motifs. So um, the tools were primitive, the labor intensive, but they got the result. Huge effort, huge effort. Uh, not a quick one, clearly. So I'm not as fast as if this is on genetics, I'm not answering. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, in the case of, of Karnak, uh, there are many examples there where the orthostats have been recycled from stones like that. Yes. Yes. To what extent do you find that in Ireland? Yes, um, the excavators of the Church of the Great Tomb in the Bowling Valley have uh, found extensive uh, evidence of recycling, suggesting that uh, earlier tombs may have been dismantled, already decorated stones were brought in, and in some cases the art is inexplicably hidden, as if the old art is no longer uh, passé, and for religious or uh, ritual reasons, they redecorate the stone in the current style, and by removing stones, curved stones have been pulled away as part of the excavation process, and they find hidden art, which, you know, defies explanation, other than the recycling theory. Absolutely. Absolutely. And while we're on the, uh, the whole motif thing, um, there is belief that art and art style is both indigenous to the island of Ireland, but also reflects contact and exchange with the Breton tombs as well. So there is that evidence in the art style to suggest contact and exchange, as well as evidence of indigenous style. Uh, to uh, come back to the question of the um, skin of the, the tomb, uh, whether there was grass or um, some gravel or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I understood you correctly, you said um, that it was cut by stone, not by grass, and that uh, 
what work can for and use that the period when they go that have a program ritual. And my parents uh, just started playing and uh, I came up as a idea of a kind of gardener uh, uprooting the grass, yep. which of course yep. uh, spread it. Yep. Um, is this what you are thinking of? Because if we imagine such a care of these monuments, yes. uh, this would say a lot of the society. It does. Um, if you take archaeological excavations and the cross sections that come out of those excavations, what is very clear is that once the internal architecture is laid down and erected, the passage, the chamber, the cobbling, or whatever else that makes up the burial component, they then start to heap up and build up successive layers of earth stripped from the local topography nearby and the collection of usually uh, glacial water road stones, which are small stones or pebbles, which would have littered the area. So clearly, laborers were sent into the fields to haul and bring layers of turds and also the water so uh, water roll stones together that gives you a matrix which is going to be extremely stable in terms of its binding and cohesion and undoubtedly they knew exactly what they were doing they were building these tombs to last they're not only testimony to the past they're not only testimony to the present but they're also statements about what's the longevity and the meaning of these tombs to future generations so really, again, cosmology. It is all about, you know, this looking back, the present, and looking forward. Why else would they build such massive mounds? And if you think about Newgrange, it goes in um, 19 meters into a mound which is 80 meters in diameter. And actually, I didn't have time, but now that we're in questions, I can deal with it. Lionel, is that okay? <laughs> Two minutes. Two seconds. Um, Microgravity surveys of the mounds recently carried out using geophysics to investigate for secondary chambers revealed none. And the technique revealed the extant chamber, which proved that it was working. And the survey of the whole mound using microgravity techniques revealed no cavity. So we're now pretty sure, and I think that debate is now dead, that there is only one passage and one chamber in that mine. And it only goes a fraction of the way in, but yes, you have a massive cairn, far and away bigger than what is required to cover the actual architectural component within. So, maintaining such a structure clearly would have been part of the brief at the edge. I hope you've enjoyed this showcase to cultural astronomy. If you want to keep in touch with us, we have a web page, SEAC, SEAC, European Society for Astronomy and Culture. I want to thank Frank for his talk tonight, um, inspiring and full of energy and enthusiasm for us and our feeling that we are moving forward as the bridging stone in the art that's needed to try and unlock our past and understand our astronomy as a place in every civilization. Thank you ever so much for coming. We hope you've enjoyed it. Good night. Thank you.